And he slowed it down for me, and I'd like to do that for you today. He said, the sun represents your spirit. It's always high, always shining, ready to tell you where you need to go, ready to make you fulfilled. But the earth represents you. And just as the earth turns, parts of the world become dark. He said, we do the same thing with our spirit. We don't listen to it, and that's when our world falls apart. Well, I understood this. So I asked him the next obvious question. I looked at him and I said, reflection, because that's what I call him. How do I stop myself from spinning away from my spirit? How can I always be guided by my spirit? He didn't answer me. I said, mm mm. You were real talkative reflection a couple of seconds ago. Now, come on, how do I stop myself from spinning away from my spirit? How can I always be guided by my spirit? He didn't answer me. Or did he? I stood and I thought. That's how I think. Silence. That's it, silence. You're trying to tell me that I never take the time to just be silent and still and listen to my spirit. I'm so busy trying to be all things to all people that I never take the time to be silent. Silence is the key, isn't it? He said, mm-hmm. I said, well, what do I do now? He said, shut up. And I have, ladies and gentlemen, for at least five minutes every day, I'm completely silent and still. And it has changed my life immeasurably. But there's not enough silence in the world, ladies and gentlemen. Think about it. If you're like I used to be, you wake up to an alarm clock buzzing off in your ear. Burr, that's your first sign of life. There's no silence there. Then you jump into the shower and the water's running down your back and you're singing a show tune. I did it my way. I never said you were singing well. <laughs> then you get out of the shower, you get into the car, you turn on the morning talk radio. There's no silence there. Then you get to work, you talk to your employees and the people above you. Then you get off work, you get back in the car, you turn on the radio again. This time you turn to traffic to see what's the best way to get home. You get home, you plop your feet up in front of the television set, you watch Ally McBeal, Felicity, Dawson's Creek, whatever happens to be on that evening. Then you get a bite to eat, you go to sleep, you start the whole process all over again. Ladies and gentlemen, like the old lady Claire on the Burger King commercials used to ask, where's the beef? I ask you, where's the silence? Where's the silence? I saw my friend John just the other day, he was skateboarding. I ran up behind him, I said, John, you're skating towards a dead end. He just kept going. I said, John, you're skating towards a dead end. He just kept going. Doody, doody, doody. I said, John! Oh well. <laughs> John couldn't hear me, he had his headphones on. But the same way I was trying to get through to John and he wasn't listening is the same way our spirit's trying to get through to us, trying to give us everything we want. But we too have tuned into something else. Ladies and gentlemen, what am I saying? I'm saying this. If you take five minutes of silence each day, I guarantee you that the other 23 hours and 55 minutes of your day will be filled with a tranquility, a serenity, a peacefulness you never even knew existed. Five minutes of silence will give you confidence exuding from every pore in your being. And five minutes of silence, ladies and gentlemen, will lead you to feel fulfilled. How do I know? Because I'm still here. No longer do I wake up to my life and fear it, all because I had the courage to listen to my spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to leave you with one thing today. This one thing is more powerful than anything I could ever say as a speaker, more meaningful than anything I can ever say as a Toastmaster. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to leave you with this. Madam Contest. Speaker number eight, Ed Tate. One of those days, one of those days, Ed Tate. There you go, Mr. Tate. Next time, drive a little slower. 
Speaking of slow, have you ever wondered why it takes a police officer so long to write a ticket? <laughs> Completely eliminating all that time that you have made up. <laughs> I said to myself, it's going to be one of those days. But I did the math, and there was still time for me to make the noon flight to Phoenix, Arizona. All I had to do was park my car, go through security, and off to the gate. As luck would have it, I found the parking spot right away. But when I made it to security, there were lines as far as the eye could see. For the first time in aviation history, United had decided to enforce the two-bag limit. I did the math. There was no way I was going to make my noon flight. It's going to be one of those days. Now I was upset with United. It was because of uh, their policy that I was going to miss my flight. At least that was going to be my story. I looked on the departure board. There was a two o'clock flight to Phoenix. If I made that flight, I could still make my meeting. I said to myself, I'm a frequent flyer with United. I've paid tens of thousands of dollars with this airlines. They had better figure out a way to get me on that plane. Otherwise, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. I made it over to customer service. In front of me, there was a couple, a tall young man and his girlfriend. The conversation between the tall young man and the customer service agent went something like this. What do you mean there's no room for us on the two o'clock flight to Phoenix? It's because of United Airlines I missed our connection in the first place. I'm a frequent flyer. I've spent tens of thousands of dollars on this airlines. You had better figure out a way to get us on that plane. <laughs> the customer service agent said, sir, the next flight where I can get both of you on the flight is at six o'clock. He said, do the math, lady. The wedding is at five. <laughs> then he committed the unpardonable sin. He called her the B word. And the silence was deafening. Then he stormed off, and I was next. <laughs> oh boy, it's going to be. I made eye contact with the customer service agent, and all of a sudden it occurred to me that she was trying to do the best that she could. She was trying to provide for her family just like me. I was no better than her. I made eye contact with her, and I said, ma'am, take your time. I'm in no hurry. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> she said, sir, what can I do for you today? I says, ma'am, I couldn't help but overhear that the next flight to Phoenix is booked. If you could put me on any flight to Phoenix today, that would be fine. Her fingers danced across the keyboard, and she presented me with a ticket on the 2 o'clock flight to Phoenix. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, woo! I really didn't do that, but it was close. I said, ma'am, thank you very much, and don't let it be one of those days. I had some time to kill, so I decided to go over to the food court. And who in line is in front ahead of me? The tall, angry young man and his girlfriend. I said to myself, boy, I hope they get his order right. I also thought to myself, you know, someone ought to say something to that guy. Someone ought to give them a piece of their mind. Someone ought to do that. Then I heard this voice, and it said, Ed, if not you, <laughs> then who? I hate when this happens. I started to walk towards him. By the way, did I mention that he was tall? Six foot four, about 220. Folks, don't let the video screens fool you. I am not a big man. I tapped him on the shoulder. I said, excuse me, sir, I know it's none of my business, but if it's true what you say and you are a frequent flyer, then you know two things. 
Number one, the question is not if, the question is when you will miss your next flight. And number two, that customer service agent, she's not a pilot. She had nothing to do with you missing your connection. The next time this happens, and it will happen again, I want you to be nice. <laughs> then all of a sudden, pow! His girlfriend hit him in the arm and said, yeah, be nice. <laughs> now some of y'all thought I got hit, didn't you? <laughs> he walked away in stunned silence, rubbing his arm. Finally, I made it to the gate, and I noticed something unusual. Typically, a gate is manned by uniformed personnel, but on this particular occasion, in addition to them, there was a man in a suit. Now, usually suits mean trouble. And I thought to myself, well, maybe that customer service rep wasn't supposed to give me this ticket. I handed my ticket to the gate agent, and the gate agent whispers to the suit, this is the guy. I says, oh no, they're gonna take my ticket. The gentleman in the suit said, Mr. Tate, I'm the general manager for United Airlines. I want to thank you for what you have done. As I reached up to shake his hand, I said, he's just trying to soften me up <laughs> so he can take my ticket. I said, what am I being thanked for? He said, sir, one of our supervisors was at the food court and she witnessed when you confronted the angry young man. You see, Mr. Tate, our number one priority is to, is to get our passengers safely to their destination, and we do that every single day. Occasionally, we get them there on time. <laughs> Seldom, if ever, does anyone stand up for, you, for us, and I just want to thank you, sir. Mr. Tate, may I please have your ticket? Darn it, I knew it! <laughs> he was gonna take my ticket. But the gate agent handed me a first-class ticket on the two o'clock flight to Phoenix. And it was like I always said, I knew it was gonna be... Mr. Toastmaster. Contestant number five, Darren LaCroix. Ouch, ouch, Darren LaCroix. Can you remember a moment when a brilliant idea flashed into your head? It was perfect for you. And then all of a sudden, from the depths of your brain, another thought started forcing its way forward through the enthusiasm until finally it shouted, yeah, great idea, but what if you... <laughs> fall on your face. What do you do when you fall on your face? Do you try and jump right up and hope no one noticed? Are you more concerned with what other people will think than what you can learn from this? <laughs> Mr. Contest Chair. <laughs> Friends and the people way in the back. Ouch. <laughs> Did you feel I stayed down too long? <laughs> Have you ever stayed down too long? After four years of business school, I went out and I went for the American dream. I bought a Subway sandwich shop. <laughs> oh yeah. You're all impressed, I can tell. I don't want to brag or anything, but in six short months, I took a $60,000 debt and I doubled that debt. <laughs> That's right, I turned Subway Sandwich Shop into a nonprofit organization. <laughs> I 
I financially fell on my face. But then I remembered, I was not the only one from my hometown of Auburn to fall on his face. You see, a hundred years earlier, my childhood hero, Dr. Robert Goddard, had a ridiculous idea about building a device to take off from the ground and reach the stars. Dr. Goddard was the reason we landed on the moon. I remember when I had my ridiculous idea. I was listening to a tape of Brian Tracy, a great speaker. He asked a question. He said, what would you dare to dream if you knew you wouldn't fail? I struggled for an answer and then, bing! I'd be a comedian. <laughs> but you have to understand my background. I wasn't funny. I wasn't considered a class clown. In fact, the first time my brother ever laughed at me was when I told him I wanted to be a comedian. <laughs> Ouch! Who do you want to be? What changes do you want to make in your life? So many of us can see clearly where we want to go, and yet we go back and forth. If I just had a little more time, if I just had a little more money, if, if the kids were just a little older, but we never take that first step. Dr. Goddard's first flight took off in Auburn and landed in Auburn. <laughs> it only reached 41 feet, but it was a first step. There are strangers out there, people who don't even know you, who will make fun of your first step. When the local press found out about Dr. Goddard's ridiculous idea to reach the moon and his first flight, the next morning the headlines read, Moon Rocket misses target by 238,799 and a half miles. Ouch! But those strangers are part of your process. We also have friends and family that love us and don't want to see us fall on our face. Imagine my parents' reaction when after stretching their budget to help me through college, seeing me fall on my face, and then I come home. Mom, Dad, I want to be a comedian. <laughs> I was met by silence. They, too, are part of your process. After a year of struggling in the comedy world, I'll never forget one night. I was bombing for 20 minutes. It was horrible. So I went for my surefire bit. I brought a woman up from the audience, and she stood directly behind me. She put her hands forward in place of mine. It's an old improv technique. She would tell the story with her hand gestures as I would tell it verbally. And it works best. The more animated the hands are, well, this woman stood there like an ancient statue. <laughs> she didn't move. I turned to her in desperation. I said, please do something with your hands. She did. <laughs> Ouch. I immediately called my mentor, Rick. I said, Rick, I bombed. They died. They hated me. Rick said, so? What do you mean, so? How do you argue it's so? <laughs> and then Rick reminded me, every comedian, every speaker, anyone who's accomplished anything has fallen on their face. It's part of your process. And then I remembered Subway. I fell on my face, but I never took the next step. It's the step after the ouch that's so important. It's so difficult. We don't like the ouch. We don't want to take that step, but when that foot lands, you are going to like that feeling. We learn from the ouch. In an effort to reach the moon, Dr. Goddard said, failures I consider valuable negative information. <laughs> information essential to each step getting closer to the moon. Dr. Goddard was an ouch master. <laughs> we need to be ouch masters. If you're willing to fail, you can learn anything. I still have my day job. But now in my hometown, in a comedy club, my picture hangs on the wall. But it's because I took the step after 
the ouch. I wasn't given the gift of making people laugh. I was given the opportunity to take a next step. So were you. What's your next step? When will you take it? Take it. I didn't want to look back on my life and think, never did try that comedy thing, but instead, I paid all my bills. <laughs> we're all going to move forward and try and reach a point, but we're going to reach a point at, headed to our goals where we get stuck and we can't move. And but we're so afraid of that ouch, we forget that if we lean forward and take a risk and fall on our face, we still made progress. <laughs> Go ahead and fall. Fall forward. <laughs> Speaker number three, Dwayne Smith. Music in the key of life. Music in the key of life, Dwayne Smith. I want to put a song in your heart, some glide in your stride, and some hump in your bump. <laughs> I want to do as the musical group Sly and the Family Stone said in 1969. I want to take you higher. Mr. Contest Master, fellow Toastmasters and guests, I want to take you to a higher understanding of music and the key of life. I'll share how music is related to our everyday lives. The influence of musical styles like bebop and the blues. And I'll share how music can sometimes be the key to life. The music of our lives and the life of our music are woven into the fabric of our being. Life is music and music is life and surely you cannot have one without the other. You see, it's my humble opinion that without music, you aren't living. You are merely existing like a shark in shallow water, like a bear cub who has lost its mother, like the ex-chief accountant at Enron, <laughs> merely existing. Many of us don't even realize that we go through life with musical accompaniment. As babies, we are rocked to sleep to the sound of a lullaby. Children learn about the world around them musically. I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle, here is my spout. Well, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> and have you ever been driving home after a bad day at work heard your favorite song on the radio and your spirits were lifted, only music has that effect. And it doesn't matter what type of music you like. Now, my favorite, one of my favorite styles of music is called bebop. It's a genre of modern jazz that has severely revamped chord structures, unusually accented rhythmic phrasing, and lots of improvisation. Now, many of us live our lives in a bebop kind of way, in that we tend to do things differently from others. We take on life as it comes, and we make up stuff as we go along. <laughs> now, you may have figured out that beboppers don't like to plan. In fact, they like to do as the great jazz singer Ella Fitzgerald once said, and I quote, a skiddly weedy beep beep weedy little bop bop a doo wee. They just want to live, baby. <laughs> they don't want to play. 
Another musical style that I like is called the blues. Now the blues is based on a simple 12 bar musical pattern and it talks about the hardships and sadness of life with subjects like the dog died, the man cheated, the heart is broken, lost my job, can't pay the rent, the woman left me, took the kids and the pink Cadillac with the diamond in the back. <laughs> now that's sad. But the beauty of the blues is that it shows us we can take our hardest of hard times, the saddest of sad times, add a little wah-wah and some ka-ching, ka-ching, and create a tune that'll make your heart sing. That's the blues. A friend of mine once went through some hard times, some sad times. Times that were so hard and so sad that he almost committed suicide. His name is Benny. And his mother had passed away a few months earlier. And he just completed a nasty divorce. Benny couldn't stand the idea that his wife no longer wanted him. Or that one day his two young sons would be raised by another man. Benny felt that these and many other things were all coming down on him at the same time and that the only way out of this mess was to end it all. He rented a cheap hotel room. As he was sitting there on the bed, listening to the little radio, trying to work up the nerve to pull that trigger, a commercial came on that played to the tune of the little teapot song. Benny thought back to the time that his youngest son was struggling to learn that tune, and he almost smiled. When the commercial ended, the next song was one that reminded him of the time that he and his ex-wife were so in love. And as he began to reminisce about the good old days, he began to feel good inside. But he quickly turned the radio off, click. Because as he told me later on, when you're about to commit suicide, the last thing you want to do is feel good. <laughs> Ruins the whole moment. <laughs> but wouldn't you know it, as soon as he turned that radio off, he began to hear music from one of the other rooms. And they were playing his mother's Favorite song, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind. But now I see. And Benny could clearly see because he was convinced that God was telling him through music to stop feeling sorry for himself, to appreciate the things that he had, and to live. To this very day, Benny has never reconsidered suicide. Ladies and gentlemen, music is an important part of our lives. It is with us every day, in every way. So whether you're in a bebop kind of mood or in a bluesy mood, whether your life is up or whether your life is down, remember this. Music might not save the world, but it might save you. Music might not save the world, but it gives you something to dance to. Music is not written in the key of give up. Music is not written in the key of let go. Music is not written in those keys. Oh, no. Music might. Music might. Music might not save the world, but it eases the toils and strife because music is written in the key of life. Our next speaker, Jim Key. Never too late, never too late, Jim Key.
theater was quiet. The aroma of overpriced popcorn permeated the air. You settled in for the perfect family outing, and then it happened. The film that you were watching took a sudden emotional turn. You try to resist it, but you can't help it. And before you know it, your eyes begin to sweat. <laughs> you may not care that people see you crying in public, but the last time this happened to me, I was thankful the theater was dark. Until my lovely young daughter, who doesn't know it's okay to whisper, <laughs> pierced the darkness with, are you crying? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, and anyone who's ever gotten misty at the movies, never ignore inquisitive children. <laughs> the longer you do, the louder they get. In a matter of seconds, my daughter shouted, why are you crying, daddy? When this happened, the movie that my family and I were watching was The Rookie. On the surface, it's a movie about the oldest rookie in professional baseball, but on a much deeper level, it's about reclaiming life's missed opportunities. When the movie ended and I realized what a great teaching opportunity I had, I turned to my two sons and I said, guys, what did you learn from this? Imagine how proud I was when my 16-year-old said, I learned that my dad cries at the movies. <laughs> my 12-year-old took the question and his well-being a bit more seriously. He said, I learned that it's never too late to follow your dreams. It's never too late to follow your dreams. Why does it sometimes take a child to remind us of that? It's because children are uninhibited dreamers. In fact, last year I was speaking to an elementary school assembly and I asked the question, if you could have any job in the world, what would it be? And one little guy said, ooh, ooh, to be the guy that rides on the back of a garbage truck. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> His passion was proof that he knew something many adults have forgotten. Dreaming is fun. It's natural and it's necessary. Every notable accomplishment in human history began as a dream. Do you remember how you dreamed as a child? Back when we had this wonderful sense of innocence, we could gaze into the future and imagine all sorts of possibilities. Then we turn our focus to adulthood. And many of us find that by the time we actually get here, we hit a wall. And we stop dreaming because we can't see past next week. Why? What happened? Somewhere along the way, we learned a painful truth. We learned that failing to achieve our dreams hurts. We encounter critics who ridicule and crush our dreams, and it hurts. And we hear an inner voice that says, please, no more. I can't take being hurt again. We convince ourselves that it's better to just give up those things and do what we're supposed to do instead of longing for what we were meant to do. Ladies and gentlemen, we were meant to dream. We were meant to dream. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., one of the greatest dreamers of our age, said, the time is always right to do what is right. And that means that if it was right for us to dream as children, then it's just as right for us to dream as adults. The question is, do we have the courage to dream? I am privileged to know a remarkable teenage girl who does. Her name is Nicole. And you should know 
that Nicole is hearing impaired, she is vision impaired, and three years ago she survived a stroke. That's not fair. If anyone has the right to give up on dreams and just accept reality, she does. But instead, I've watched Nicole redefine reality, not according to her physical limitations, but according to the size of her dream. As part of that, two years ago, I watched her stand on a huge stage in front of almost 3,000 people and perform the sweetest song I've never heard. She sang it through sign language, and I didn't just see it. Deep inside, I felt it. Instead of hiding behind justifiable excuses, there she stood teaching me it's never too late.